Defending the Earth, a dialogue between Murray Bookchin and Dave Foreman, published by South End Press, Boston, Massachusetts, 1991. Chapter 1, Looking for Common Ground Murray Bookchin I have been a social activist for over 55 years. I was a radical labor union organizer in the 1930s and 1940s, and I was deeply involved in the civil rights movement, the New Left, and the countercultural movement of the 1960s and 1970s. I have also been a longtime activist in the ecology movement. I am pleased, for example that Roderick Nash set the record straight in his book The Rights of Nature by pointing out that I was on the ecological battlefront a long time ago, well before the word ecology was even widely used. Most people do not know that I was on the ecological front lines as far back as 1952. At that time, I opposed the use of pesticides and additives in food. In 1954, I campaigned against nuclear testing and fallout. I protested the radioactive pollution problems of the peaceful atom that became public with the wind-scale nuclear reactor incident in Great Britain in 1956 and then later when Con Edison attempted to construct the world's largest nuclear reactor in the very heart of New York City in 1963. Since then, I have been active in anti-nuke alliances such as Clamshell and Shad and their predecessors such as Ecology Action East. More recently I've done what I can as a member of the Burlington Greens in Vermont and I have helped start a continental left green network that works within the green committees of correspondence. My goal has long been to help build a genuinely radical North American green movement that will harmonize the relationships among human beings and between society and the biosphere. However, I have never limited my efforts to activism and organizing. I have had a long and vital concern with ecological philosophy and social theory. I do not think it is possible to overestimate the value of thinking insightfully and creatively about defending the earth. We need ideas, good ideas, to guide our activist work. That is what we have always emphasized at the Institute for Social Ecology which I co-founded in 1974 with Dan Choderkoff, and which is still going strong today. In the book by Roderick Nash I just mentioned, Nash maintains that I have few equals when it comes to time spent laboring in the trenches of radical environmental theory. Note. Roderick Nash, The Rights of Nature, A History of Environmental Ethics, 164. End note. I like to think that this is true. Without sounding too immodest, I have been on the front line of green political thought. Since 1952, I have written over 13 books on social-slash-ecological theory, including Our Synthetic Environment, which came out six months before Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, toward an ecological society The Ecology of Freedom, The Modern Crisis, and, most recently Remaking Society, Pathways to a Green Future. I have also taught over 2,000 students at the Institute and have traveled and lectured widely. So I urge people, when you feel that you want to be critical of my ideas, and I think that you should, please be good enough to read my writings and listen to what I have to say. I'm getting a lot of critical stuff right now from the academic professorial crowd in which people are criticizing me on the basis of only one or two articles and sometimes even hearsay. I am not asking ask you to read all of my stuff, just enough to make a responsible assessment and criticism. If people do read my work, they will discover that besides having been a labor organizer in foundries and auto plants in a number of big industrial cities, besides having been a revolutionary leftist for over 55 years, I share a good deal of the ecological state of mind of my conservation friends in Earth First. Does that surprise people? Frankly I see eye to eye with the activists of Earth First on a large number of things. In many ways, I think they and Dave Foreman are doing a wonderful job. I feel a very keen sympathy for their many direct action campaigns to protect wilderness. They are not terrorists as the FBI would have you believe. They are doing important work, work I strongly support. While support for wilderness preservation is peppered throughout my writings, people may not realize that I am a wilderness freak. I have not spent all my time on picket lines, in meetings, in my office, or in libraries. My passion for wilderness areas, for wildlife, 
is a lifelong passion. From my childhood onward, when the Bronx still had some stands of original forest, I loved exploring the wild world. I've been to almost every national forest and every national park in the United States and many in Europe, from the Olympics and the Smokies to the Black Forest in Germany. I picked up the Appalachian Trail as far north as Vermont, and as far south as Tennessee. I've hiked it everywhere in between. I couldn't stop heading for the Ramapo Mountains every single weekend for the greater part of two years when I taught in New Jersey. I love those mountains dearly. Some of the greatest moments in my life have been hiking deep into forest areas in winter alone, where if I so much as sprained my ankle I would freeze to death. My greatest regret now that I am 70 and suffer from a severe case of osteoarthritis is that I can no longer hike in the wilderness. Today I have to be a more distant admirer. I would physically stand shoulder to shoulder with everyone in earth first to defend wild areas if I could. On this score, there is no opposition between Dave Foreman and myself, none whatsoever. Our society has got to learn to live in peace with the planet, with the rest of the biosphere. We are in complete agreement on this fundamental point. We now live under the constant threat that the world of life will be irrevocably undermined by a society gone mad in its need to grow replacing the organic by the inorganic, soil by concrete forest by barren earth, and the diversity of life forms by simplified ecosystems, in short, by turning back the evolutionary clock to an earlier, more inorganic, mineralized world that is incapable of supporting complex life forms of any kind, including the human species. The entire world of life, including those few but wonderful wild places that remain, must be protected. Indeed, wild areas must be expanded. Dave and I have no disagreement on this. I also agree that we need to promote a rational solution to the human population problem. The world's human population needs to be brought into a workable equilibrium with the carrying capacity of the planet. Sooner or later, the mindless proliferation of human beings will have to be dealt with. It is absolutely essential, however, that we first clearly identify what we mean by terms like overpopulation and carrying capacity. This is where the thinking of some deep ecologists frightens me. We need an understanding of the problem that has nothing to do with gas chambers and racism. I know what it means to face the brunt of a population control program. All my relatives in Europe are dead. They were murdered in the Nazi Holocaust. They were slaughtered in the name of a population problem. For Hitler, the world would be overpopulated if just one Jew was left alive. I've never believed that people in Earth first are fascists. I am afraid, however, of certain positions and statements, the tendency of which remind me of things I heard 50 years ago when there was a worldwide fascist movement that used naturalistic Malthusian arguments to justify racist population control policies. This abuse of the overpopulation issue is not just a distant historical issue, either. The abuse of the population issue is ongoing. Just look at what the Rockefeller crowd is trying to do in the third world. It is a remarkably dangerous question which has to be carefully and rationally discussed if we are to resist racism, sexism, and genocide. Even deep ecologists like Warwick Fox agree that it is monstrous to talk of AIDS as a population control measure or, in the name of letting nature seek its balance, refusing to aid starving children in Ethiopia. Note. Warwick Fox, The Deep Ecology Ecofeminism Debate and Its Parallels, Environmental Ethics, Number 11, 1989, and 38. End note. So I ask all of you, everyone in the ecology movement, to please be careful about the population problem. This is a hot issue, a very hot issue. Don't kid yourselves about the objectives of many of those who talk of population control. I went through the 1930s. We paid the price of 60 million lives back then as the result of a racist, imperialist war and mass extermination policy. This sort of thing is not radical ecology. We have to explore this matter carefully and respect the very reasonable fears of women and people of color who have been victimized by population control programs in the past. We have to explore what a humane and ecologically sound solution is. 
it is important that we unscramble what constitutes the social aspects of the problem from the purely biological ones and to understand how these two aspects of the problem interact with each other. Please let us be careful. Can we agree on this? Let me move on to another concern. The ultimate moral appeal of Earth First is that it urges us to safeguard the natural world from our ecologically destructive societies, that is, in some sense, from ourselves. But, I have to ask, who is this us from which the living world has to be protected? This, too, is an important question. Is it humanity? Is it the human species per se? Is it people as such? Or is it our particular society our particular civilization, with its hierarchical social relations which pit men against women, privileged whites against people of color, elites against masses, employers against workers, the first world against the third world, and, ultimately a cancer-like, grow-or-die industrial capitalist economic system against the natural world and other life forms. Is this not the social root of the popular belief that nature is a mere object of social domination, valuable only as a resource? All too often we are told by liberal environmentalists, and not a few deep ecologists, that it is we as a species or, at least, we as an amalgam of anthropocentric individuals that are responsible for the breakdown of the web of life. I remember an environmental presentation staged by the Museum of Natural History in New York during the 1970s in which the public was exposed to a long series of exhibits, each depicting examples of pollution and ecological disruption. The exhibit which closed the presentation carried a startling sign, the most dangerous animal on earth. It consisted simply of a huge mirror which reflected back the person who stood in front of it. I remember a black child standing in front of that mirror while a white school teacher tried to explain the message which this arrogant exhibit tried to convey. Mind you, there was no exhibit of corporate boards of directors planning to deforest a mountainside or of government officials acting in collusion with them. One of the problems with this asocial, species-centered way of thinking, of course is that it blames the victim. Let's face it, when you say a black kid in Harlem is as much to blame for the ecological crisis as the president of Exxon, you are letting one off the hook and slandering the other. Such talk by environmentalists makes grassroots coalition building next to impossible. Oppressed people know that humanity is hierarchically organized around complicated divisions that are ignored only at their peril. Black people know this well when they confront whites. The poor know this well when they confront the wealthy. The third world knows it well when it confronts the first world. Women know it well when they confront patriarchal males. The radical ecology movement needs to know it too. All this loose talk of we, masks the reality of social power and social institutions. It masks the fact that the social forces that are tearing down the planet are the same social forces which threaten to degrade women, people of color, workers, and ordinary citizens. It masks the fact that there is a historical connection between the way people deal with each other as social beings and the way they treat the rest of nature. It masks the fact that our ecological problems are fundamentally social problems requiring fundamental social change. That is what I mean by social ecology. It makes a big difference in how societies relate to the natural world whether people live in cooperative, non-hierarchical, and decentralized communities or in hierarchical, class-ridden, and authoritarian mass societies. Similarly the ecological impact of human reason, science, and technology depends enormously on the type of society in which these forces are shaped and employed. Perhaps the biggest question that all wings of the radical ecology movement must satisfactorily answer is just what do we mean by nature? If we are committed to defending nature, it is important to clearly understand what we mean by this. Is nature, the real world, essentially the remnants of the Earth's pre-human and pristine biosphere that has now been vastly reduced and poisoned by the alien presence of the human species? Is nature what we see when we look out on an unpeopled vista from a mountain? Is it a cosmic arrangement of beings frozen in a moment of eternity to be abjectly revered, adored, and untouched by human intervention? Or is nature much broader in meaning? Is nature an evolutionary process which is cumulative and which includes human beings? 
the ecology movement will get nowhere unless it understands that the human species is no less a product of natural evolution than blue-green algae, whales, and bears. To conceptually separate human beings and society from nature by viewing humanity as an inherently unnatural force in the world leads, philosophically either to an anti-nature anthropocentrism or a misanthropic aversion to the human species. Let's face it, such misanthropy does surface within certain ecological circles. Even Arne Ness admits that many deep ecologists talk as if they look upon humans as intruders in wonderful nature. Note. Arne Ness Finding Common Ground, Green Synthesis, No. 30, March 1989, 9. End note. We are part of nature, a product of a long evolutionary journey. To some degree, we carry the ancient oceans in our blood. To a very large degree we go through a kind of biological evolution as fetuses. It is not alien to natural evolution that a species called human beings has emerged over billions of years which is capable of thinking in sophisticated ways. Our brains and nervous systems did not suddenly spring into existence without long antecedents in natural history. That which we most prize as integral to our humanity, our extraordinary capacity to think on complex conceptual levels, can be traced back to the nerve network of primitive invertebrates. The ganglia of a mollusk, the spinal cord of a fish, the brain of an amphibian, and the cerebral cortex of a primate. We need to understand that the human species has evolved as a remarkably creative and social life form that is organized to create a place for itself in the natural world, not only to adapt to the rest of nature. The human species, its different societies, and its enormous powers to alter the environment were not invented by a group of ideologues called humanists who decided that nature was made to serve humanity and its needs. Humanity's distinct powers have emerged out of eons of evolutionary development and out of centuries of cultural development. These remarkable powers present us, however, with an enormous moral responsibility. We can contribute to the diversity fecundity and richness of the natural world, what I call first nature more consciously perhaps, than any other animal. Or, our societies, second nature, can exploit the whole web of life and tear down the planet in a rapacious, cancerous manner. The future that awaits the world of life ultimately depends upon what kind of society or second nature we create. This probably affects, more than any other single factor, how we interact with and intervene in biological or first nature. And make no mistake about it, the future of first nature, the primary concern of conservationists, is dependent on the results of this interaction. The central problem we face today is that the social evolution of second nature has taken a wrong turn. Society is poisoned. It has been poisoned for thousands of years, from before the Bronze Age. It has been warped by rule by elders, by patriarchy by warriors, by hierarchies of all sorts which have led now to the current situation of a world threatened by competitive, nuclear-armed, nation-states, and a phenomenally destructive corporate capitalist system in the West and an equally ecologically destructive, though now crumbling, bureaucratic state capitalist system in the East. We need to create an ecologically oriented society out of the present anti-ecological one. If we can change the direction of our civilization's social evolution, human beings can assist in the creation of a truly free nature, where all of our human traits, intellectual, communicative, and social, are placed at the service of natural evolution to consciously increase biotic diversity diminish suffering, foster the further evolution of new and ecologically valuable life forms, and reduce the impact of disastrous accidents or the harsh effects of harmful change. Our species, gifted by the creativity of natural evolution itself, could play the role of nature rendered self-conscious. Audience member Excuse me, I want to know what you have to say about the technological fix called genetic engineering? I'm hearing other species, other animals, being spoken about by you as subordinate moments in the evolution of human consciousness, the self-consciousness which you call second nature. It seems to me that if we choose to believe this about other organisms then there is no reason to resist genetically engineering other organisms to suit our wishes. What kind of spiritual perspective does this represent?
Murray Bookchin. I have some surprising news for you. I don't believe that human beings are lords over nature and that animals and other forms of life are subordinates. I beg you again, please read what I have written and listen with care to what I have to say. For years, I have advocated an ethics of complementarity. Complementarity, as distinguished from domination, presupposes a new sensibility that respects other forms of life for their own sake and that responds actively in the form of a creative, loving, and supportive symbiosis. Let me make it very plain. I don't trust the current scientific establishment to invent a toothpick, let alone tinker with bioengineering. I believe that we have to bring all of this garbage to an end right now. The current social setup means that the scientific establishment is not morally capable of dealing with biotechnology. The truth is, given the current structure of technological innovation, it will put almost anything it creates to some kind of malicious and vicious purpose. I am not advancing a view that approves of natural engineering. The natural world, as I have stressed repeatedly in my writings, is much too complex to be controlled by human ingenuity, science, and technology. My own anarchist proclivities have fostered in my thinking a love of spontaneity be it in human behavior or in natural development. Natural evolution cannot be denied its own spontaneity and fecundity. That is why one part of our struggle should always be to protect and expand wilderness areas. Furthermore, let's completely put an end to the claims that I approve of cruelty to animals. Admittedly I'd like to see a cure, if possible to cancer, to diseases that cause pain and so on, but believe me, torturing animals in the name of research is monstrous. It has to be stopped. I just saw a documentary about what they do to research animals. It is unspeakable what a man preparing an MA thesis will do to an animal in order to merely prove that the animal feels pain. Do they have to discover that? These are great minds at work indeed. The power to torment living beings has to be taken away from researchers. The current state of affairs is horrible. So understand that at this moment, where things stand right now, I am practically a Luddite. I should make that plain. Our society is so immoral that it can't be entrusted to invent anything until we are able to sit down and decide, as a socially responsible ecologically sensitive community how we're going to design and use our technology. This is not to say that I oppose research or technology but this society is not morally fit to decide what is necessary or not. Another way is possible of course. Ecotechnologies can and should be developed. There has been some interesting work in this area during the last 25 years. I have personally experimented with various ecotechnologies since 1974 at the Institute for Social Ecology. There we put up solar collectors, windmills, ecologically designed buildings, we worked with aquaculture and organic agriculture assisted by a variety of tools and techniques. Other groups such as the New Alchemy Institute have been working on these things even more intensely than we have. I am convinced a liberatory eco-technology is possible. Hopefully we can all agree on that. If people do read my work, we can also put to rest the supposition that my outlook is anti-spiritual. This claim is utter nonsense. Anyone who reads The Ecology of Freedom will find that it repeatedly calls for a new ecological sensibility for a new spirituality. There is full agreement on the need for a spiritual connection to the natural world. The only possible disagreement is whether or not this ecological spiritual sensibility will be naturalist or supernaturalist in orientation. Since spirituality can mean a decent, indeed, a wholesome sensitivity to nature and its subtle interconnections, it is very important that we keep the ecology movement from degrading this concept into a required or expected belief in an atavistic, simple-minded form of nature worship peopled by gods, goddesses, and eventually by a new hierarchy of priests and priestesses. People who believe that the solution to the ecological crisis is to create a new green religion or to revive beliefs in ancient gods, goddesses, or wood sprites are mystically obscuring the need for social change. The tendency to do just this among many deep ecologists, eco-feminists, and new age greens concerns me. The distinction I make between a needed naturalistic spirituality and an unnecessary, and potentially harmful, 
supernaturalistic green religion is a valuable contribution, I think. Let me close by saying I believe that there is much common ground between Dave Foreman and myself. As I said before, we should give our support to Earth First and their direct action campaigns to preserve what is left of wild nature. Dave is on the front line on this question and deserves, together with the rest of Earth First, our full support, especially now when Earth First is under attack by the FBI. We cannot let the FBI get away with painting the radical ecology movement as terrorist. I've been involved in radical direct action politics all my life. I know what it is like to be attacked by the FBI. I know what a bunch of lunatics they are. People seriously working to defend the Earth will soon find themselves going up against powerful utilities, large corporations, private detective agencies, local police departments, and the FBI. I only wish I still had the physical ability to directly take part in daring nonviolent direct action campaigns such as Redwood Summer. I also want to say that I think that many of the political differences between Dave and myself are complementary. Dave and Earth First work on preserving the wilderness, I and others are trying to create a new grassroots municipal politics, a new cooperative economics, a new pattern of science and technology to go along with their direct action demonstrations, rallies, and protests to protect wilderness. We need to learn that we are different aspects of a single movement. We also need to try to amicably deal with those principled political differences that do exist between us. There are probably still some major problems between us that have to be explored. Yet, even if we can't straighten them all out, we must at least learn how to better work together on what we can agree on. Our future depends on it. Dave Foreman I agree with everything Murray just said, and I feel like I should just sit down. I'm not sure I have a whole lot more to add. Agreeing with Murray might seem a little strange for someone who started his political career as a college freshman campaigning for Barry Goldwater in 1964. Yet, I really do. Let me begin my remarks by giving you a little background on my own work and perspective within the ecology movement. I'll leave out, for now, the story of my getting over my brief infatuation with Goldwaterism. All I can say in my defense is that I didn't know at the time that Goldwater stood for paranoid anti-communism and subservience to big business. I thought he was talking about a return to libertarian, Jeffersonian democracy. Anyway, by the early 1970s I was working as a mule packer and horseshoer up in northern New Mexico and getting more and more concerned about what was happening to the national forests up there. Finally I decided to go back to Albuquerque and try to get a graduate degree in biology and get involved in the conservation movement. I immediately got involved in the U.S. Forest Service's first roadless area review and evaluation, RARE, program, which turned out to be a horrible farce. I was also studying herpetology at the time and we were supposed to go out and pickle 50 snakes and lizards before the end of the semester. Well. I was studying herpetology because I like snakes and lizards, so I ended up dropping out of grad school by the middle of the first semester and I have been a professional rabble-rousing conservationist ever since. I first went to work for the Wilderness Society early in 1973 for $250 a month as their New Mexico representative and I slowly worked my way up until I went to Washington DC in the late 1970s as their chief lobbyist. After going through the Carter administration process, where we got lobbied more than we lobbied them, and where it seemed like the more influence and access we had, the more we compromised, a number of us began to ask what had happened to the environmental movement. At that time, newspapers and TV news were reassigning all their environmental reporters, because the environmental movement was dull. We were also concerned that environmental groups were becoming indistinguishable from the corporations they were supposedly fighting. I guess if you organize yourself like a corporation, you begin to think like a corporation. People who had once gotten a job in the movement by being active volunteers now were more concerned with improving their individual careers. They did not want to rock the boat because they didn't want to spoil their chances of being administrative aid to a senator or an assistant secretary of the interior at some point in the future. Given our frustration with the conventional conservation movement, 
several of us who worked for the Wilderness Society the Sierra Club, and Friends of the Earth began talking about sparking a fundamentalist revival within the environmental movement. We wanted to get back to the basics of John Muir and Aldo Leopold. So on a camping trip in the desert in Mexico, we decided it was time to quit talking about how bad things had gotten and actually do something about it. We started Earth first. Maybe we were all just going through an early midlife crisis. I don't know. We sure had fun lowering banners down the front of the Glen Canyon Dam, making it look like it had cracked. That was one of our first actions. We were kicking up our heels a bit and playing the coyote of the environmental movement. We tried to do things with a sense of humor, Lord knows most of the social change movement in this country lacks a sense of humor. This was one of the things we very much wanted to bring to our work. Perhaps because of it, Earth First caught on a lot better than we ever dreamed it would. As we developed Earth First, we began to explore some techniques of radical organizing. Earth First originally came out of the mainstream conservation movement, and that is still where my roots are, and that is still the audience that I feel most comfortable speaking to and trying to influence. I think the greatest strength and accomplishment of Earth First has been our ability to redefine the parameters of the national environmental debate. Back at the beginning of the Reagan administration, the Sierra Club was being called a bunch of environmental extremists. Well, we in Earth First put an end to all that. Back in those days, there was a spectrum of debate with the Rape the Land artists over at one end and the Big Ten environmental organizations over at the other. Yet, in an attempt to be credible proper, and respectable the conservationists kept moving over towards the Rape the Land artists before we ever even opened our mouths. The eventual result, of course was a narrowing of the spectrum of debate a narrowing that favored the big industry developers. So, we in Earth First tried to create some space on the far end of the spectrum for a radical environmentalist perspective. And, as a result of our staking out the position of unapologetic, uncompromising wilderness lovers with a bent for monkey wrenching and direct action, I think we have allowed the Sierra Club and other groups to actually take stronger positions than they would have before and yet appear to be more moderate than ever. What's different now is that they are compared to us. I think that the role of an avant-garde group is to throw out ideas that are objected to as absurd or ridiculous at first, but which end up trickling into the mainstream and becoming more accepted over time. We were the first people to talk about the preservation of all old-growth forests. Before us, no mainstream conservation groups were even talking about old-growth. Now we've got the Audubon Society and the Wildlife Federation coming in on this issue. We were the first people to really bring direct action to rainforest campaigns. And now that's become very much a mainstream activity. We were pretty clear from the beginning, however, that we were not the radical environmental movement. We only saw ourselves as one slice of the radical environmental movement. I know I have no absolute total, and complete answer to the worldwide ecological crisis we are in. My path is not the right path it's the path that works for me. I think there are dozens and dozens of other approaches and ideas that we will need in order to solve the crisis we're in right now. We need that kind of diversity within our movement. In Earth First, we have tended to specialize in what we're good at, wilderness preservation and endangered species. That doesn't mean the other issues aren't important, it just means that we mostly talk about what we know most about. We work on what moves us most particularly. It doesn't mean that we're the whole operation, or that we're covering all the bases. We need all the approaches and angles. I need to emphasize, too, that while I work on those things I know best, on those issues which touch me the most deeply it doesn't mean that the social problems that Murray mentioned are irrelevant, or that I'm not sympathetic to them. Hell, I've been arrested six times standing in front of bulldozers, or logging trucks, or otherwise fighting giant corporations that are trying to destroy our national parks and our national forests. I think my book Eco Defense, A Field Guide to Monkey Wrenching is probably one of the most effective little anti-capitalist tracks ever written. I know we are talking radical, anti-capitalist social change here. 
One problem I've had in getting the fullness of my message out comes from my impatience at seeing eco-catastrophe going on all around me while so many of those on the left who are always talking about social justice don't seem to even see the problem or care about other species. Let's face it, right now we're in the greatest extinction crisis in the entire three and one half billion year history of life on this planet. Raymond Dasman has said that World War III has already begun and that it is being waged by the multinational corporations against the Earth. Note. Raymond Dasman works with bioregionalist Peter Berg at the Planet Drum Foundation which publishes the Raise the Stakes newspaper and been helped organize the North American bioregional movement. End note. We may lose one-third of all species in the next 20 years because of multinational greed. I am deeply concerned about what is happening to people all over the world. Yet, unlike much of the left, I'm also very concerned with what's happening to a million other species on the planet who haven't asked for this eco-catastrophe to happen to them. And I have a connection that is very fundamental and very passionate with those other species. I feel a real kinship with them, as well as with members of my own species. And I think, as Murray pointed out, it's very difficult to separate the two concerns. Or, at least, it should be. Regardless of what our emphasis is, regardless of whether it's goose music that plays a symphony to us, or the diversity of people in a vibrant place like New York City that plays a symphony to us, I think we have to recognize that we are on the same side. Unfortunately for me, when you see this kind of eco-crisis all around you and you react to it, and you begin to suggest some of the things that may happen if we don't wise up and change our way of living on this planet, your ideas may come out as though you're welcoming some of those things. It may come out as though you're saying ought instead of is. I think the problem of the Cassandra is to try to make it very clear that you're predicting certain things because you don't want them to happen, because you want people to wake up. It's not that you're chortling over any suffering. You are compassionate. You are concerned. You're on the side of all the people who are the victims of multinational imperialism around the world. That probably hasn't come out as clearly as it should have in my discussions to date of ecological problems. But it is very real to me, and I'm very concerned about it. Audience member Mr. Foreman, if you have the slightest commitment to linking issues of social justice with questions of ecological degradation and to trying to find common ground here, how do you reconcile this new tone with your repeated statements in the Earth First Journal that in order to save the ecology of the United States we need to militarily close the U.S., Mexican border and keep what you call the Latin American hordes from overwhelming us? Dave Foreman I don't think you've ever read anything I've written. I've seen comments circulating like you've described. Ed Abbey has said things somewhat like that, but I've never written anything about militarily sealing the border. Note. For a look at Foreman's initial position on immigration, see Dave Foreman, Is Sanctuary the Answer, Earth First, November 1, 1987, 21-22. End note. Listen, I live in the Southwest. All my relatives on my sister's side are Hispanic. I spend a lot of time in Mexico and have a lot of concern for Central America's problems. I support bilingual education and legislation. I have also actively supported the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua and opposed U.S. foreign policy in the region. I think, however, that there comes a time when we have to ask some tough questions about whether standard political solutions are going to work. I've looked at what happens to people from south of the border and Arizona, how they're exploited by large corporations. I look at how an open border serves as an overflow safety valve to get rid of dissidents in Latin America and to provide a source of cheap, non-union labor for corporations here at home. And I ask myself, what is being solved by that? I think we delude ourselves when we pretend that somehow by having an open border we're solving any problems in Latin America. I'm not saying seal the border. I don't think that works. Hell, I'm in complete sympathy with the Central American Sanctuary Movement. I see the repression and the police state that the Border Patrol is creating in California. 
but I think that we delude ourselves when we come up with simple solutions to complex problems. It's not sealing the border and it's not opening the border. I think that we will have to solve the deeper problem on a much more multi-pronged basis. For one thing, it is probably going to require changing US foreign policy. I think if we're going to help solve the social and ecological problems of Latin America we've got to get the CIA out of there, we've got to get United Fruit Company out of there, we've got to get the United States government backed into the position where it can't go in and prop up dictators when their own people throw them out. Our government has done that in Guatemala, in Chile, and it keeps trying in Nicaragua. That is at the heart of most of the problems. As I said before, I'd be happy to join all of you sitting in front of military disembarkation points when they start to invade Nicaragua, which is certainly the most progressive and the most ecological country in Latin America right now, despite the concessions that the US government keeps forcing the Sandinistas to make. We are all engaged in a battle for life against profit. We are engaged in a struggle for a life of egalitarianism instead of a life of greed and imperialism. We have the same enemies. We are fighting the same battle regardless of what we emphasize. Gifford Pinchot, the first director of the United States Forest Service, said there are only two things on earth, people, and natural resources. I think Donald Trump and George Bush would amend that by saying there's only one thing on earth, natural resources. Ordinary people become just another natural resource to the big imperial man. Murray is right. It's one fight. I must say however, that for all my intellectual understanding of imperialism, it was directly encountering the repressive power of the FBI and doing a little time in federal custody that really brought home to me the reality of people suffering throughout the world. Personally experiencing a little of the repressive power of the state has a tendency I think, to create a lot more sympathy for oppressed groups around the world. I certainly have a more visceral appreciation for people suffering these days since the FBI visited me. From my viewpoint, the FBI effort against me began at about 5 in the morning on May 30, 1989. A Doberman down the street started barking, so I put my earplugs in. About two hours later, my wife went to answer the door as it was about to be broken down and opened it up to six men standing there with drawn .357 magnums and wearing bulletproof vests. They flashed badges at her and pushed her out of the way. They then started running down the hall to our bedroom, they somehow already knew right where it was. At this point, I vaguely began to come awake as I heard an unfamiliar but authoritative voice yelling my name. I opened up my eyes, still with my ear plugs in, disoriented. May in Tucson is very hot, and I didn't have anything on. And I woke up and there were three guys with bulletproof vests and drawn .357 magnums standing around the bed. That kind of alarm clock doesn't have a snooze button, you can't go back to sleep for another five minutes. At first I thought, am I on candid camera? But I realized very quickly that these guys were serious. I then started thinking about some of the FBI attacks on the Black Panthers, like the FBI slash Chicago police murder of Fred Hampton, who was shot in his apartment while he lay asleep in bed. I fully expected bullets to start coming my way. But being a nice, middle-class honky male, they can't get away with that stuff quite as easily as they could with Fred, or with all the native people on the Pine Ridge Reservation back in the early 70s. So they just dragged me out of bed. They let me put on a pair of shorts, and they hauled me outside. I did not know what I was being arrested for until six hours later, when I saw a magistrate. Essentially what had happened, we found out, was that the FBI had spent three years and two million dollars trying to frame a bunch of people in Earth first for trying to create a conspiracy to damage government property. We now know for a fact that the FBI infiltrated Earth First groups across the country with informers and agent provocateurs seeking to entrap people into illegal activities. They have amassed 500 hours of tape recordings of our meetings, our personal conversations, and our phone calls. They have also broken into our houses and offices and tried to intimidate numerous ecology activists in several states by agent interrogations and grand jury investigations. My supposed co-conspirators, 
three unarmed activists who were arrested by some 50 armed FBI agents on foot, on horseback, and in two helicopters while standing at the base of a power line tower in the desert, were arrested the day before me. Mind you, these three environmentalists were driven to the site by an undercover FBI agent who had infiltrated Earth first. The whole escapade was largely his idea. He was the only one talking about explosives. I, of course was nowhere near the scene but I was still described by the FBI as the financier, the leader, the guru to get all this going. I was likened to a mafia boss and the other three defendants were described as my munchkins. I had only met the FBI infiltrator a couple of times before and very briefly. I couldn't even remember his last name. We had never planned to do anything together. But that doesn't matter to the FBI. Back in the 1970s, the FBI issued a memo to all their field offices telling them that when you are trying to break up a dissident group, don't worry if you have any evidence or facts. Just go in, make a big arrest, make wild charges, have a press conference, and that's what the media's going to pick up. That's the news story. The damage to the group is done. You can always drop the charges against them later. That's no problem. It almost invariably gets less attention in the press. The big lie that the FBI pushed at their press conference the day after the arrests was that we were a bunch of terrorists conspiring to cut the power lines into the Palo Verde and Diablo Canyon nuclear facilities in order to cause a nuclear meltdown and threaten public health and safety. Essentially what we need to understand is that the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which was formed just after the Palmer raids in 1921, was set up from the very beginning to inhibit internal political dissent. They rarely go after criminals. They're a thought police. And let's face it, that's what the whole government is. Foreman's first law of government reads that the purpose of the state, and all its constituent elements, is the defense of an entrenched economic elite and philosophic orthodoxy. Thankfully there's a corollary to that law they aren't always very smart and competent in carrying out their plans. In this case I think the US government has made a major tactical mistake, because even the usually compliant mass media are not buying its story. We have gotten some remarkably even-handed press coverage. I also recently spoke to the Sierra Club International Assembly and had a terrific response. People just aren't buying it. So I'm very hopeful we're going to overcome this, though we will undoubtedly be hearing more from the FBI in the future. Before I close let me just say that I agree with Murray that the warped social evolution of our civilization has left us with a very weird way of looking at reality. I agree a lot with Dave Ehrenfeld, who characterizes the dominant philosophy of the modern world as being one where human beings are the measure of all value, where we think that we can solve all problems, either through technological means or through sociological means, where we believe that all resources are either infinite or have infinite substitutes, and where we believe that human civilization will continue to progress and will exist forever. And to me, that is stark, raving insanity. Note. For a full presentation of Ehrenfeld's critical view of humanism, see David Ehrenfeld, The Arrogance of Humanism, New York, Oxford University Press, 1978. End note. I think there is no reason, divine or otherwise why human beings, unless they wake up, will not make themselves extinct. There is a great deal of madness around us. Julian Simon, for example is a Republican economist who said recently that there really are no limits to economic growth because after all, we'll soon be able to change any element into any other element. Note. For a full presentation of Simon's critical view of ecological limit to growth theories, see Julian Simon, The Ultimate Resource, Princeton, Princeton University Press, 1981. End note. Therefore, the supply of copper is restrained only by the entire weight of the universe. I can't even begin to talk to somebody like that. I mean, we aren't only speaking a different language, we're living on different planets in different dimensions. And it's that kind of common madness that I think is profoundly irrational. I talk a lot about being non-rational, about using all sides of my brain, 
including the good old reptilian cortex back here. But I think there is nothing more rational, nothing more sensible than trying to keep in mind what Aldo Leopold called the first rule of intelligent tinkering, save all the pieces. We aren't saving all the pieces. Species and whole habitats are being destroyed at a rate unparalleled in the Earth's history. It is as if we are going through a complicated Swiss watch with a bulldozer right now. My own response to this situation is a sort of weird, cowboy twist on Zen Buddhism. I don't believe in reforming the system anymore. I believe in monkey wrenching it, thwarting it, and helping it to fall on its face by using its own stored energy against itself. When people talk to me about the destruction of property about the evils of destroying bulldozers, all I can say is that a bulldozer is made out of iron ore. It's part of the earth. A bulldozer is the earth, transmogrified into a monster destroying itself. By monkey wrenching it, you liberate a bulldozer's dharma nature and return it to the earth. As I see it, Murray and I, atheists that we both probably are, are trying in various ways to help industrial civilization find its own dharma nature, and become an egalitarian, more tribal society that respects people and respects the earth once again.